Book Seven, Sections Thirteen and Fourteen of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Seven, Sections Thirteen and Fourteen. Thirteen. Returning to the Constitution itself. Let us seek to determine out of what and what sort of elements the state which is to be happy and well governed should be composed. There are two things in which all well-being consists. One of them is the choice of a right end and aim of action, and the other the discovery of the actions which are meant towards it, for the means and the end may agree or disagree. Sometimes the right end is set before men, but in practice they fail to attain it. And in other cases they are successful in all the means, but they propose to themselves a bad end, and sometimes they fail in both. Take, for example, the art of medicine. Physicians do not always understand the nature of health, and also the means which they use may not affect the desired end. In all arts and sciences, both the end and the means should be equally within our control. The happiness and well-being which all men manifestly desire. Some have the power of attaining, but to others, from some accident or defect of nature, the attainment of them is not granted. For a good life requires a supply of external goods, in a less degree when men are in a good state, in a greater degree when they are in a lower state. Others again, who possess the conditions of happiness, go utterly wrong from the first in the pursuit of it. But since our object is to discover the best form of government. That, namely, under which a city will be best governed, and since the city is best governed, which has the greatest opportunity of obtaining happiness, it is evident that we must clearly ascertain the nature of happiness. We maintain and have said in the Ethics, if the arguments there adduced are of any value, that happiness is the realization and perfect exercise of virtue, and this is not conditional but absolute. And I used the term conditional to express that which is indispensable, and absolute to express that which is good in itself. Take the case of just actions; just punishments and chastisements do indeed spring from a good principle, but they are good only because we cannot do without them. It would be better that neither individuals nor states should need anything of the sort, but actions which aim at honor and advantage are absolutely the best. The conditional action is the only choice of a lesser evil, whereas these are the foundation and creation of good. A good man may make the best even of poverty and disease, and the other ills of life, but he can only obtain happiness under the opposite conditions. For this also has been determined in accordance with ethical arguments, that the good man is he for whom, because he is virtuous, the things that are absolutely good are good. And it is also plain that his use of these goods must be virtuous in the absolute sense of good. This makes men fancy that external goods are the cause of happiness. Yet we might as well say that a brilliant performance on the lyre was to be attributed to the instrument, and not to the skill of the performer. It follows then from what has been said that some things the legislator must find ready in his hand in a state, others he must provide. And therefore, we can only say, may our state be constituted in such a manner as to be blessed with the goods of which fortune disposes, for we acknowledge her power. Whereas virtue and goodness in the state are not a matter of chance, but the result of knowledge and purpose. A city can be virtuous only when the citizens who have a share in the government are virtuous, and in our state all the citizens share in the government. Let us then inquire how a man becomes virtuous. For even if we could suppose the citizen body to be virtuous, without each of them being so, yet the latter would be better. For in the virtue of each, the virtue of all is involved. There are three things which make men good and virtuous. These are nature, habit, rational principle. In the first place, every one must be born a man and not some other animal. So too, he must have a certain character, both of body and soul. But some qualities there is no use in having at birth, for they are altered by habit, and there are some gifts which by nature are made to be turned by habit into good or bad. 
animals lead, for the most part, a life of nature, though in lesser particulars some are influenced by habit as well. Man has rational principle in addition, and man only. Wherefore nature, habit, and rational principle must be in harmony with one another, for they do not always agree. Men do many things against habit and nature, if rational principle persuades them that they ought. We have already determined what natures are likely to be most easily molded by the hands of the legislator. And else is the work of education. We learn some things by habit, and some by instruction. 14. Since every political society is composed of rulers and subjects, let us consider whether the relations of one to the other should interchange or be permanent. For the education of the citizens will necessarily vary with the answer given to this question. Now, if some men excelled others in the same degree in which gods and heroes are supposed to excel mankind in general, having in the first place a great advantage even in their bodies, and secondly in their minds, so that the superiority of the governors was indisputed and patent to their subjects, it would clearly be better that once for all the one class should rule and the other serve. But since this is unattainable, and kings have no marked superiority over their subjects, such as Silax affirms to be found among the Indians, it is obviously necessary on many grounds that all the citizens alike should take their turn of governing and being governed. Equality consists in the same treatment of similar persons, and no government can stand which is not founded upon justice. For if the government must be unjust, every one in the country unites with the governed in the desire to have a revolution, and it is an impossibility that the members of the government can be so numerous as to be stronger than all their enemies put together. Yet that governors should excel their subjects is undeniable. How all this is to be effected, and in what way they will respectively share in the government, the legislator has to consider. The subject has been already mentioned. Nature herself has provided the distinction, when she made a difference between old and young within the same species, of whom she fitted the one to govern and the other to be governed. No one takes offense at being governed when he is young, nor does he think himself better than his governors, especially if, he will enjoy the same privilege when he reaches the required age. We conclude that from one point of view governors and governed are identical, and from another different, and therefore their education must be the same and also different. For he who would learn to command well must, as men say, first of all learn to obey. As I observed in the first part of this treatise, there is one rule which is for the sake of the rulers, and another rule which is for the sake of the ruled, the former is a despotic, the latter a free government. Some commands differ not in the thing commanded, but in the intention with which they are imposed. Wherefore, many apparently menial offenses are an honor to the free youth by whom they are performed, for actions do not differ as honorable or dishonorable in themselves, so much as in the end and intention of them. But since we say that the virtue of the citizen and ruler is the same as that of the good man, and that the same person must first be a subject and then a ruler, the legislator has to see that they became good men, and by what means this may be accomplished, and what is the end of the perfect life. Now the soul of man is divided into two parts, one of which has a rational principle in itself, and the other, not having a rational principle in itself, is able to obey such a principle and we call a man in any way good, because he has the virtues of these two parts. In which of them the end is more likely to be found is no matter of doubt to those who adopt our division. For in the world, both of nature and of art, the inferior always exists for the sake of the better or superior, and the better or superior is that which has a rational principle. This principle, too, in our ordinary way of speaking, is divided into two kinds, for there is a practical and a speculative principle. This part, then, must evidently be similarly divided. And there must be a corresponding division of actions. The actions of the naturally better part are to be preferred by those who have it in their power to attain to two out of the three or to all, for that is always to every one the most eligible, which is the highest attainable by him. The whole of life is further divided into two parts. 
business and leisure, war and peace, and of actions some aim at what is necessary and useful, and some at what is honorable. And the preference given to one or the other class of actions must necessarily be like the preference given to one or the other part of the soul, and its actions over the other. There must be war for the sake of peace, business for the sake of leisure, things useful and necessary for the sake of things honorable. All these points the statesman should keep in view when he frames his laws. He should consider the parts of the soul and their functions, and above all, the better and the end. He should also remember the diversities of human lives and actions. For men must be able to engage in business and go to war, but leisure and peace are better. They must do what is necessary, and indeed what is useful, but what is honorable is better. On such principles children and persons of every age, which requires education, should be trained. Whereas even the Hellenes of the present day, who are reputed to be best governed, and the legislators who gave them their constitutions, do not appear to have framed their governments with a regard to the best end, or to have given them laws and education with a view to all the virtues, but in a vulgar spirit have fallen back on those which promised to be more useful and profitable. Many modern writers have taken in a similar view. They commend the Lacedaemonian constitution, and praise the legislator for making conquest and war his sole aim, a doctrine which may be refuted by argument, and has long ago been refuted by facts. For most men desire empire in the hope of accumulating the goods of fortune, and on this ground Thibrin and all those who have written about the Lacedaemonian constitution have praised their legislator because the Lacedaemonians, by being trained to meet dangers, gained great power. But surely they are not a happy people now that their empire has passed away, nor was their legislator right. How ridiculous is the result, if, when they are continuing in the observance of his laws, and no one interferes with them, they have lost the better part of life. These writers further err about the sort of government which the legislator should approve, for the government of free men is nobler and implies more virtue than despotic government. Neither is a city to be deemed happy, or a legislator to be praised, because he trains his citizens to conquer, and obtain dominion over their neighbors, for there is a great evil in this. On a similar principle, any citizen who could, should obviously try to obtain the power in his own state. The crime which the Lacedaemonians accuse King Pausanias of attempting, although he had so great honor already. No such principle, and no law having this object, is either statesmanlike, or useful, or right. For the same things are best both for individuals and for states, and these are the things which the legislator ought to implant in the minds of his citizens. Neither should men study war with a view to the enslavement of those who did not deserve to be enslaved. But first of all, they should provide against their own enslavement, and in the second place obtain empire for the good of the governed, and not for the sake of exercising a general despotism, and in the third place they should seek to be masters only over those who deserve to be slaves. Facts, as well as arguments, prove that the legislator should direct all his military and other measures to the provision of leisure and the establishment of peace. For most of these military states are safe only while they are at war, but fall when they have acquired their empire, like unused iron they lose their temper in time of peace. And for this the legislator is to blame, he never having taught them how to lead the life of peace. End of Book 7, Sections 13 and 14